Hi, I'm Jim Doty, and welcome to Chapman Shorts, the inaugural show of Chapman Shorts. And I'm very pleased to have Eve Cornier, a friend of our Dodge College of Film and Media Arts here at Chapman University. And we have something in common, don't we, Eve? We love films. We, we're both great moviegoers, and we have a terrific film for you today, uh, directed by a young filmmaker, Brett Simmons. Welcome to the show, Thanks Brett. Thanks for welcome. having me. Thanks for having me. I know uh, your, your, your Chapman short was the first uh, Chapman student film ever yeah. uh, shown at the Sundance Film Festival. It's true. It was an honor. And, and uh, well, thank you for giving Chapman that honor. <laughs> to, to tell, how did you get into film in the first place? Um, well, you know, I, I, I learned very young that I wanted to make movies. I grew up in a family of artists, and um, my whole life I've been surrounded by all the arts, mainly music and um, painting and drawing and things. And so I grew up wanting to originally draw and animate and things like that. But then I realized that my real passion behind it was wanting to tell stories and make movies. I was a big fan of animated movies. And so I learned pretty quickly that I wanted to make films, and I started making movies at like 10 years old with my dad's video camera and you know all my neighbors and stuff. And I think everyone was waiting to see if it was going to wear off, and it never really did. I just kept doing it. So. How did you get to Chapman? To Chapman, well, you know, like every high school graduate, I was applying to all the schools I wanted to go to, most specifically film schools for me. And, um, the most exciting thing to me about Chapman, I, was, I mean, I was accepted to all the film schools I applied to, but Chapman was the only film school that put a camera in my hand day one. You know, I've always been really passionate about telling stories and storytelling, and so when I look at the curriculum, and the first class I'm going to take is intro to visual storytelling, I'm like, yes. <laughs> so that was very exciting. It was, it was pretty much a no-brainer for me when it came down to the options I had. And, um, it was a great experience. I mean, we were making movies from the first day all the way till the day I left. Well, tell us about a short. The, the, mm -hmm. How does the Chapman short enter mm -hmm. into the, the requirements, the graduation requirements? You know, I don't even know other than it's less than 30 minutes long. Um, at the time, it was very flexible. Do you have to do a short? Flexible. Do all the graduates have to do yeah. a short film? There's a, the senior thesis class, you have to make a, a senior thesis film. Um, it's kind of like the culmination of your four years, like everything you've learned, apply it here. Like your capstone you course. Exactly. And, 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 and so this, this show that we're doing, we're mm -hmm. going to be doing a weekly show on Chapman Shorts, mm -hmm. and this is our inaugural episode. Oh, this is so great. So this is a classic short. Are there <laughs> elements to it? Is, is it like a short story as compared to you, a novel? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, shorts are really tricky, and I actually, even like having moved on to the feature world, I'm still very passionate about short films because the narrative style is very different. It's, it's, much, it's much quicker. You know, you got to you want to try and tell a complete story in just a fraction of the time. And um, in short films, that's what's so exciting to me is how can I tell the life of this character or how can I best fill this story with all of its needs in a very concise amount of time. You know, there's no room for fat. That's all just very lean, very tight. And so. Now, in an earlier conversation, mm -hmm. you mentioned that your grandmother and your grandfather, who you spent a lot of time with, yeah. did not allow you to watch television, right. but to tell stories through writing. It's true. Did that help you in any way? That was, yeah, that was torture as a child, but probably <laughs> the most valuable thing that could have ever happened to me. Um, we weren't allowed to watch TV. Um, because the whole, the whole thought that my grandparents had, and they were very artistic was, you know, they even made like a little fake TV and a little slideshow like film reel and they were just like, like, you know, create the images, you know, draw it out, you know, how about you write it out? What movie do you want to watch? What would the story be like? What would huh. the characters do? And so they were always very much about, you know, storytelling and, you know, at night they would tell us stories all the time. We'd gather around rather than watching TV, they'd try and put on plays, you know, they'd direct us some plays and things like that. So it was all about all the different facets of storytelling, which is always just very exciting to me and very appealing. Even today, I mean, it's very, very, very appealing. Uh, is there a technical requirement to a short film? For example, at Sundance, when it was right. shown, does it have to be less, less than 30 minutes? Right. Is that it, 30 minutes? It has to be less than 30 minutes. Uh -huh. But I mean, even, even over 20 minutes is pretty long. Yeah, and this, um, is, uh, this is closer to the 30 minutes. Yeah, this is 27 minutes. And the whole, this is funny because Husk, when I made it, I, I made it as a bit of a pitch for the feature film because I knew that I wanted this to be kind of a, like a small encapsulation of the bigger story that I wanted to tell. And so I wasn't quite so concerned with the requirements at the time when I was making it. Um, 
But it all paid off really well. I mean, a lot of people, the story, they've enjoyed it enough that they've really kind of forgiven how long it is. And it is short enough to be a short, but it's a pretty long but short. But it's a horror genre, which is right. uh, very unusual. And I think right. in your next film that you are mm -hmm. making, you're in the process of making, it's mm -hmm. a romantic comedy. But going back to Husk, mm -hmm. I understand that you picked the characters right. and you picked the actors yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you were very involved with the very film involved. itself. It's true. And you actually entered that in 2004. Yeah. And would you tell us a story about how it ended up in 2005? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Sundance. I went through the festival circuit of 2004. I graduated in 04 from Chapman with Husk under my arm. I actually made several other films that I was submitting to festivals along with Husk, but Husk was the only one that people were biting. So I was like, oh, man, this is, I guess this is the one. And it went through all the festivals that I submitted to. Uh, throughout the course of 04. And the festival circuit was great and it was an invaluable experience and it was a great education, but it was a bit of an emotional roller coaster for me. So I finally, um, I finally just stopped. I mean, after all the success I was having getting into festivals, I could have kept going. I just didn't have the, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was like, you know, I'm not going to, this is so much work doing this. I'm just going to stop and focus on making a movie. I'm going to find how can I make another movie? Because my passion is being behind the camera, not sitting in an audience watching my movie with strangers. So, <laughs> so I finally stopped and I dedicated all my time to making this movie and then I got a call from Sundance completely out of the blue that it was accepted into the festival. And so my instinct reaction of course was, who put you up to this, this is a hoax. Because um, I don't know how they had my number or anything like that. And so I started calling my friends, you know, just, I was telling them the news, but I wasn't telling them the news like, hey, guess what? I was telling them the news kind of like, so who do you know that may have done this to me? Which is funny because then Chapman found out and were you know, the film school and they were all immediately supportive and you know, oh, this is what you should know about the festival. Oh, we want to help you here and this, this. And I was like, guys, 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 this is all going to come crumbling down very shortly. Um, it's all a hoax. But then I sure enough got the letter from Robert Redford, which I also thought was a hoax, a forgery of some kind. <laughs> And it wasn't. And so next thing you know, I'm at the festival or I'm, you know, meeting the programmers and everything. I, just, I cannot believe this. So I finally hunted down the shorts programmers. And I was like, guys, I'm not supposed to be here, right? This is all a fluke. Like, do you even know what my movie is? I'm like, yeah, you made Husk, this, this. I was like, I couldn't believe it. So I asked them, I was like, you know, what happened? I didn't submit to this festival. I wanted to. I just, I didn't. I was, I was all I emotional. I was a bag of emotion. Yeah. So I didn't. And I was just like, how did this get here? And they said, that they saw it, and this is, this is the poetic part of it, is they saw it at the very first festival Husk ever played at, it was the Palm Springs Film Festival in June of 04. And they saw it, and that played to an audience of four people. And they weren't even one of the four people, they just saw it in the library and went, oh, this looks interesting. And so they watched it on like a little monitor there in the office. And um, they put it on what Sundance calls the flag list, where they flag the shorts that they like and want to accept when they come their way. Mm -hmm. And so when Husk didn't come their way, I don't know why or how, but they liked Husk enough that they sought it out. And they called Palm Springs and said, hey, we didn't get this short. Can you send it our way? We want to submit it. And so it was submitted for me um, without my knowing, accepted. And so I got the phone call you know, on the other end, just like, hey, congratulations. They had no idea. I and had nothing to do with Robert it. And Robert Redford. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, you've really whetted our appetite. <laughs> we're going to see it in a second. Is there right. anything you want to tell us about the film uh, that you um, warn us about before we watch it? I, I will warn. Uh, um, I don't think so, because I made it. I'm too close to the material. But I have, I have witnessed from experience that it is scarier than people realize. Yeah. So, so maybe younger people. So if there's kids in the room, yeah, send them to go do the dishes or something. <laughs> so it's rated R. R. I would say it's rated R. Yes, if I had a rating, I'd say it's rated R. Great. Well, then I so. think we're ready. Great. So, Craig, let's roll it. He deals, I get dope. Dude, what are you saying? Maybe you just suck at cards. I'm tired of being you guys' bitch. 
No amount of blackjack is going to get me into that cornfield. Johnny, you are going in the cornfield. Like hell I it's am. It's not debatable. Yeah, yeah. All right, we heard you the first time. All right. Wait, if we if we drew straws, would you consider that fair? Yeah, I would consider that fair. As long as he doesn't deal the straws. My straw looks pretty long. How about yours, Scott? You guys are <laughs> You should be on your merry way. He's your friend. You know, I don't even know what I'm looking at here, and even if I did, I wouldn't know how to fix it. Dude, screw that. Somebody's gonna drive by before Johnny even gets to the house. Wait, then why do we send Johnny to the cornfield? Did you really want to listen to that dork whine all day? Come on, man, screw him. Besides, he's fat, he needs the exercise. <laughs> Quit dicking around, Johnny! Scumbag. What? Oh, man, don't tell me you're buying that bull. He's fooling around. Hey guys, Johnny's been gone for almost an hour. He's probably making it with Farmer John's daughter. Yeah, yeah, because that'd be a good reason to scream. What if he broke his leg? Chris, pop the trunk so we can get a flashlight. I don't have one. All the shit in your car and you don't have a flashlight? I don't have one, all right? At least I have a car. Chris, pedestrian. Oh, the busted spare. It's good. Boy a scout. spare? But the car just stopped. The tire wouldn't do reminds me, Scott. Chris, come on, we're not starting this again. <laughs> this? Chris. Shortcut my ass, man. Great work, you nautical Chris. Look, Scott, could you please calm down, please? Just stay by your car, okay? We'll be back. Leave your headlights on. Wow. These things really work. Yeah. Oh, go, go, go. All right, Scott, what's the word? Yeah, practically there. Any Johnny? No. In the house, let's take it. See him? No, I'm just trying to help. Johnny! Get me down. The scarecrow's creeping me out.
Did I ever tell you I'm allergic to dust mites? Yeah, did I ever tell you I'm allergic to creepy houses? We should check in to see if they have a phone or something. A phone? Skip. I really don't think... No, wait. Come on. Sucks. I'm sick of you staring at me, you straw stuff bastard. Nice mask. Guys? Hello? Guys? You jump out at me, I swear I'll be slapping, man. No, 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 no,
Scott, where are you going? Scott! Scott, you think you might need these? Okay. Now, okay, now we can go get Johnny, throw him in the back, and then we go get Chris, and then we Brian, go... Brian, get Chris? Yes, we get Chris, and then we throw Brian, him in the back. Brian, Chris is dead. You don't know that. Brian? You don't know Brian. that. Brian. You saw him. We both saw him. I'm so, I'm so sorry, man. We can't think like that, okay? Brian? We are getting out of here. All of us. Brian, man. All of us! Brian? I think we are all of us. Sorry, man. Let's just get out of here, okay? You and me, okay? Start the car. Brian!
Chris. 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 You know, with everything that's happened to me tonight, there's something I can't figure out. Why didn't you come after me and Brian when we came through your cornfield? Johnny didn't make it. Chris, well, Chris is here. So what was it about that first time that Brian and I came through? You were here, in that chair, in this room. I mean, it was with Johnny then. And I think, I think you're just as trapped in here as I am. Chris. 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 There's anything left in you to have. Hold it.
that that car could have been here for weeks. What are you doing? Can we go? Bunny, I swear I saw somebody. Yeah, it's probably someone that's going to take a dump in the cornfield. Ew. Nice. Let's go. Uh, no. Oh, no, not now. Please, Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? If we would have kept driving, this would have not happened. Bunny, don't be a brat. Don't be nosy. Is your cell phone getting a signal? Oh, God. No. Damn it. Where are we going to get help all the way out here? Well, welcome back to Chapman Shorts. Brett, I'm proud of you. I Thank mean, you very man, much. Uh, Thank that you. was done on a student budget? Uh, less than a student budget, I'd say. <laughs> It was done for very little. It's a 27-minute movie, and we did that for about $7,000, Cindy. Oh, $7, my $4. goodness. And so. where did you film it? And we filmed it in Bakersfield, California. Um, the producer who also wrote it with me is from Bakersfield. And so, uh, yeah, we filmed it all there. It's the only place close enough that, with cornfields. The cornfields are impossible to find in California. Yeah. And they have... Yeah. I was thinking it was in yeah. Iowa or something. Right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. That would make more sense to right. go across the country, but... On the budget we had, we could barely afford to travel to Bakersfield. <laughs> did, so how long did it take to write the screenplay? And Let's see. I think I had longer to write the short script than I did the feature script. Um, because I knew, you know, the whole time you're in film school, you know you're going to be making a senior thesis. And I had the idea, maybe my end of my sophomore year, maybe junior year. And so me and my roommates, it's, it says on the credits, it's written by Guy Fitzgerald. That was the pen name for me and all my buddies because I couldn't put writing credit as Brett Simmons and his five friends. Um, <laughs> so we just took one pen name. But that's really what it was. We all lived together and we all kind of created this think tank and started collaborating on um, horror movie ideas. And so we had a lot of time to refine it. We really, the process was hilarious because each person took a pass at the story and then we'd all read it and go, okay, now I'm going to take a pass. And then ultimately, since we all knew I was going to make it, it all built up to, okay, this is great. Brett's going to do the final pass of the, of the story. But the genesis of it all really was um, all of us are big horror movie fans. And we were all so disappointed with horror movies coming out that we all kind of sat down. And I was like, I have this idea for a Scarecrow movie that was all spawned from the image of the Scarecrow dropping out the post behind the guy, mm -hmm. which freaked me out. And I have no farm background in me, so I don't know where that came from. But that's kind of where it all started. And I was like, so guys, based off of this, and Scarecrow, like, what, what kind of horror movie would we make? And, you know, we just, for fun, started brainstorming, this would be freaky, and you know, all this would be freaky, and all of a sudden we started spinning this story around. You know, the, the mu I noticed that you give it, that there's a Brett Simmons credit for music. Yes, it's and true. It reminded me a little bit of, of uh, Bernard Herrmann, who you know, yeah. did <laughs> work with Alfred Hitchcock. And oh, he's great. I think Vertigo, I mean, just one of his classics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how, how did you think of the music? How did you, because you're a musician. Right, 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 right. You come from a musician family. Yeah, it's right? funny, because I, I come from a musician family, and they're largely string um String musicians. Uh, yeah, a lot of string in there. Yeah, and then Bernard Herrmann is primarily a strings composer, and so I'm a big fan of, I just think I can't escape the Hitchcock influence in my, in my life, and so I think that all my creative instincts are either consciously or unconsciously related to Hitchcock movies I've watched. So like Bernard Herrmann, it's funny you say that it has that flavor, because it's very much strings heavy, and that's what I was mentioning before was that the, uh, the score, it's, on a student budget, especially as low budget as Husk was, you can't really get an orchestra, but you can get loops, and you can get loops with these strings, and it's cool because you can create these cool sounds and then couple mm -hmm. that with a little work yeah. on the keyboard and things. You can actually create something that sounds kind of commercial or kind of interesting as opposed to chintzy. And yeah. How did you get the idea of the nails? In the, <laughs> the nails. In the, in the, well, the it. idea behind the nails, that's funny because that's, that's, always, that's always one of the first images that everyone mentions in the movie. Yeah. Um, and the idea was the scarecrows, that the spirit's jumping from scarecrow to scarecrow. And the idea there's one spirit, and then there's all these scarecrows in the field that are basically hosting this spirit. Jumping back and forth, how does a spirit keep weapons ready? Because originally the idea was, what's mo so iconic, oh, a scarecrow should have like a sickle or a scythe or something or a pitchfork. But it's a little cheesy to assume that there's always going to be one readily available in this giant cornfield. So we thought it would probably be more intelligent and make more sense of the spirit was arming itself with these nails so that at any given moment it was ready to 
attack anybody or murder anybody. So that's kind of where it all came from, was how could, these, how could these creatures arm themselves in a way that they're always ready for attack with or without an actual weapon? And how did you actually do it in terms of the movie making? How did? Oh, that was fun. Special effects. Because yeah. was, I mean, on a, on a, sh on a tight budget, mm -hmm. it, I mean, the special effects were fantastic. Yeah, they were. Yet at the same time, you didn't have a whole lot of money. So, I mean, those, we, we very, had those no look like money. nails in a finger. I know. Well, you know, it's, that's what's so fun about film school and short filmmaking and, you know, Chapman more specifically is that you work with people who are really passionate about what they do. And so that's how you can afford to work on a lower budget because it's a lot of people just want the opportunity. And so the guys that did the makeup effects and the gore effects were guys that really just wanted a shot at doing it. They're friends of mine. Um, but you know, there's no class in the film school on how to be a horror makeup guy or how to do gore effects. <laughs> and how do you really learn how to do that other than experience? And so they were just excited at the experience. So those guys labored like crazy to figure it out. Um, Tyler, who um, was in the credits, he did the nails. And he literally just bought nails and went to uh, Home Depot and got them sawed. Like, they have like the metal saw there. Mm -hmm. And he sawed all the nails and then he was just attaching them with like spirit gum and like oh. band-aids and oh. weird things like that. Which, you know, nowadays, knowing what I know now, like in the feature we had rubber nails, which is the safe idea, but I never <laughs> would have thought of that at the time. So we had actors getting slashed at with actual nails on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, man. Uh, lucky in, nothing happened. In terms of the, the actors, uh, mm -hmm. the one uh, where where they come from? Uh, yeah. How did they come about? The actors were all. Um, uh, we auditioned a lot of guys, and you know it's only four roles in the movie, um, other than the scarecrows, and we auditioned almost a hundred guys. It was like anywhere between seventy-five and like eighty-five guys for four roles, which was an exhausting process. Um, had I been more organized, maybe I wouldn't have had to meet, see so many people, but I really just, I was young and I was ambitious. And so it, it was an open audition? Like, so it was open auditions, right. Um, the thing is, is that I went to the theater school, because I know a lot of guys in the theater school, big theater fan, and I asked them to come in and I posted the audition calls there. So we had a lot of the theater school guys come in and audition. And of the four guys, two of them are... Out you of the theater school, theater school. you're saying at Chapman? At Chapman, Chapman's, Chapman's theater, theater School. Which yeah. many people don't realize, it's, that's a separate program from separate the program, film school. Right. Uh, that's part of the College of Performing Arts. Right, exactly. Yeah. And they, you know, I've always thought, these guys are all right here, why don't we go just give them the opportunity? Because a lot of those guys are doing theater wishing they had an opportunity to be in films. So yeah. you used a musical school, mm -hmm. the film school, right, and the theater And then the theater school. school, right. All at Chapman. True. I guess that's All one of the benefit of having a film school that's True. part of a larger university. You can draw talent. Absolutely. Because it really is a collaborative process. It absolutely it? is. And that's the thing that's most exciting about film, period, to me, which, you know, spawned from when I was so young because being surrounded by all the arts, I realized from a young age that film really combined everything. Um, it was an opportunity to really like storyboarding. You can draw. You know, you get to work with wardrobe, music, acting, you know, all these different elements in one. I was just like, how can you pass this up? And they're all here at Chapman. You know, you have the performing arts school. You have all the actors. You have all the musicians. You have all the filmmakers. You even have the artists there. I mean, there's tons of people who would just love to, to work on a project. You said that, you mentioned earlier that your greatest influence was Hitchcock. Right. Which of his movies do you think influenced you the most? Oh, that's funny. Let me think. I'd say maybe The Birds. I know The Birds had a big influence on the feature. Jim and I talked about that earlier. Yeah, I love yeah. The Birds. Yeah. Love The Birds. I mean, Psycho too. Psycho, what's interesting about Psycho is how psychological and cerebral it is. I mean, it's really ahead of its time in terms of how deep it went into like thought provoking and kind of challenging, you know, different mindsets. But I see, um, I see Cary Grant in, in North mm, by Northwest North 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 when he's in the middle, he's in <laughs> I were the middle of the country yeah. somewhere and very quiet and there's Definitely. that crop duster and that's all he sees and he's yeah. going through a cornfield too so exactly. I see a little bit of that yeah, Hitchcock as well. believed a lot in isolation yeah. and being mm -hmm. so horrifying and I couldn't agree more and that's a great example and the of that. psycho with the mm -hmm. yeah I, I could see a little bit of psycho yeah. and music had a great influence on him as well it's his true, films. Yeah. yeah absolutely yeah uh, there's no Hitchcock film without uh, without the, the score yeah. exactly what about uh, professors at Chapman uh, did you were did you have any mentors that had a major you know effect? I did I had uh, I, I still think of him very fondly as David Garcia 
I passed away about a year ago. Yeah, very sad. Like very that. sad. But that guy still, I mean, it's something I've always admired because it's something I would, I would love to do with my own life is that he had so much experience that his whole motivation was he just wanted to pass on what he's learned. And so in our class, he was very nuts and bolts. He really kind of freaked me out um, <laughs> because he was very bold with his opinions. You know, he, he didn't, he wanted to tell you when something was bad. He didn't hold back. He was like the Simon Cowell of the film school, right? He wasn't trying to be mean. He was trying to help you. Yeah. It all from, came from this really like <laughs> twisted sense of caring about you, you know? And so um, he was the one, he had a lot of, he was very well versed in Hitchcock, you know, and he was, he was telling me um, about how the, my work is best spent in pre-production because, you know, the movie's really made in pre-production. And, and that's what's so interesting about Hitchcock that I learned from David was how um, Hitchcock would show up to set and people would talk about how he never worked, how he'd just sit on set and he'd do nothing. But it's because he did it all in pre-production. He was really supervising. He would come to make sure that it was happening. And then if it wasn't happening, and what he would your, check it out. And what your grandparents taught you about story, you know, putting the right. story together, that storyboarding, yeah, exactly. that was, you learned from an early age it's on. So true. And That's, story is everything. Now tell me this, because here you're trained as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. yet you're directing, which is theatrical. Mm -hmm. How did you get out of the actors' <laughs> scenes? How did you get right. them to emote the way you wanted them to uh, without a whole lot of experience in that area sure. acting yourself? You know, um, I was pretty fortunate before film school. I went to the Coronado School of the Arts down in San Diego. I'm from San Diego. Uh -huh. And they didn't have a film program when I was there. They do now. But me and a handful of other people, we were like the guinea pigs. And all they really did was they just created a theater-based curriculum for us, hoping that it would translate into film. And since, they've actually developed more of a high school program. But it was invaluable because you learn a lot about actors and their process, um, which I used a lot when I, came into, when I came into Chapman and working on film. The other thing was that I did a lot of acting in student films when I was in school. And it really was because I was lazy and I didn't want to carry C stands and move lights and things. I just wanted to be on set and watch. <laughs> I'm an observer. And so I thought, hey, if I can act in these movies, maybe, you know, I can be on set. I can watch all this stuff happening. And, um, but I also learned a lot of, by receiving direction what helped sure. me and what helped others. Yeah. Um, it's like in the case of the short and really everything I've done, I really just try to trust actors because actors have instincts and I really like them to be able to explore them in front of the camera, really. I mean, it's, I'm not one of those guys that tell you, you need to do this and this and this and this and this because I really, and that's kind of how, it, that's what I love about film is how collaborative it is. You can really trust everybody to explore their creativity and you normally get something far better than when you try to control it all to, you know, too much of a detailed degree. You have to control it to, a, I mean, that's what the director does. He creates the boundaries, but within the boundaries of the film and within the boundaries of the story, man, if you let people go off and start exploring, find some really interesting stuff. And so with the actors, that's always been my motivation with the actors is to really just let them bring what they want to the movie, and then I just watch to make sure it works or not. Do your films reflect your life flowing along? Because I understand yeah. you're married now. Yes, I am. And have a two-year-old, and your next movie is a romantic comedy. Right. Well, it's... So it's Yes, that's very true. You know, your life always informs your art. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think I could have made a romantic comedy when I was in college, but being married and having a son. That gives you a lot of material. A lot of material, <laughs> right, exactly. Well, you know, I met my wife here at Chapman. She was a music student at the, at the music school here. And I was in love with her very quickly. And so our, our, our story is very romantic. It's very fairy tale. Um, she and I actually, when we first got married, we played Prince Charming Cinderella at Disneyland for a little while, <laughs> pay the bills, <laughs> which is really funny. So, I mean, it was literally fairy tale. Literally like. <laughs> fairy tale romance, my goodness. But that informed the romantic comedy yeah. a great deal um, because, you know, it was, it was an opportunity for me to express my definition of the love I found in my wife, which is funny because then my son, having, the birth of my son really influenced the Husk feature because I having my son alive really influenced how I treated life and death in a horror movie. Well, speaking of a feature, mm -hmm. I mean, there must be thousands of short films that are produced by young mm -hmm. filmmakers, filmmakers yeah. from all over the world, and right. maybe a handful that 
ever make it as a feature film, picked up and right. then expanded. In other words, a short yeah. story becoming a novella or a novel. Right, exactly, exactly. And yours was. Tell us about That's that true. process. Who found it and oh, how did you get wild. the financing? That's everybody's dream, I know. Brett. <laughs> I know, and it's. I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of technical things that happen, but I got to say, because this is one of the things I never really expected, was how difficult the process would be in terms of how emotional it would get, how long it would take, and the endurance and the perseverance required. Um, the house was at Sundance in 2005, and from Sundance, I got a manager, and then uh, there were a lot of people that came and saw the short there, so I came home. This was something I learned from David Garcia. He said, don't bring anything there. Use it all as an excuse to meet with people when you get back. And so I had the feature script, and I had my DVDs, my resume, and everything ready at Sundance. And I was meeting all these people, and I kept pocketing them, saying, you know, if you, how about we meet up in LA, and I'll give it to you. And so I was able to transition a lot of, which worked. That was all my wink to David. But they, um, as a result, I was able to get a lot of meetings with some great production. I mean, I was meeting with people that I had been dreaming about meeting. I met with, like, Dimension Films and Wes Craven's company. And I'm sitting there just like, oh, I'm just like a kid <laughs> in a candy store which I think came across totally nerdy in the room. And um, so I got to meet with all these companies, <laughs> which was great. But, you know, it's, it's tough because, you know, I'm young. And that's what's so hard for young filmmakers with short films is it's a bit of a risk. And so I got a lot of maybes, but I never got yeses. But I never got noes either because no one wanted to shoo me away and miss out on an opportunity, but no one really wanted to commit to me either. So I spent, let's see, 2005... It was the beginning of 2005, January, and I spent the whole rest of the year in meetings, hoping upon hoping. And it wasn't until, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to put the timeline together in my head. It wasn't until the end of 2005 that someone became serious about Husk. And so I spent a whole year in and out of fantastic meetings that were all just, oh gosh. In when the is meantime, this you're happen? Prince Charming paying the bill. Right, right. right. <laughs> Cinderella, right. But um, so that was tough, but then I finally got with a production company and so you think, wow, great, everything's going to happen. This is awesome. But then <laughs> even in that case, you know, with the production company, you know, and they were all great, and we were developing Husk for a year, and I had a contract with them, and we were going to make it. But they were trying to make a low-budget horror movie amongst all these bigger movies, and so it constantly was getting shelved, not for lack of interest, but priority. It's business. It's film business. You know, it's not just film fun. You know, it's film business. And so they're having to prioritize their investments, which I totally understand. And so they asked me for a second year because that, of that whole year, we just weren't able to make it happen. They asked me for a second year, and I liked them. And I was like, of course, yeah. But then the same thing happened the next year. And they all, it's just so difficult because they all remained so very interested in it. And I knew they wanted to make it, and I didn't want to walk away and not make it. But at the same time, you know, I'm sitting there just like, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? And those are the stories you don't always hear about the struggle even when it seems like things are working out. And so finally, I reached this point where I was just like, you know, guys, it's the end of the second year. I'm going to take it. And I'm going to go look for another company. No hard feelings. There, no, we have no hard feelings either. Anyway, I was able to leave on good terms. But that was a very scary step. Yeah. Because I was leaving <laughs> a sure risk. thing. A huge, huge risk. Um, which, I mean, I, I guess I was pretty courageous. But I don't know. It was pretty scary. I'm not afraid to admit but it was, it was the right move within six months. It found itself in the hands of After Dark Films, who produced the feature with me. And, uh, and I couldn't have asked for a better partnership. It's one of those things where every day on set, making the feature, which we shot in July of this year, 09, and uh, every day I was sitting there thanking God that I hadn't made the movie a day prior because so much of who I am now informed the movie. And I feel, really feel like, the movie has turned out the way that it needed to turn out, not the way that I wanted it to turn out before, but the way that it really, really needed to turn out. And I've learned so much going through the process that I, I really can't, I don't regret any single day that I've had to wait. Right. Are you like Orson Welles in the Mercury mm. Theater where you have your own group now? And <laughs> did any of the, the people involved mm. in Husk the Short end up on Short? Uh, yes, Husk, the feature some film? of them did. Some of them did. The, the most notable is the guy that played the scarecrow in the short. He also played Johnny. His name's yes. Tim Losey. He was the scarecrows in the feature. So that mm. was the coolest thing. <laughs> um, and then one of my good friends from Chapman, um, 
he's my cinematographer. He didn't actually, sh he shot everything I've done except for Husk. But his name is Jeff Dolan and he shot the feature, which was great. Um, and I tried to bring, I tried to bring so many more of my friends on and it was just so difficult because this company, you know, they're really making the movie. They're hiring me to make it, you know. And so I kind of went into it thinking, sweet, I'm going to be king of the hill. I'm going to get to do whatever I want. Well, really, although it was my movie, I was also the employee, yeah. which is also something that I would have never anticipated. So I tried the best I could to get everybody. Now, but when will it be released? Do you have a don't date? don't have a release date yet. I'm still finishing post-production on it. I see. What's that so like? It's... It's a dream come true. It's wild. I have to pinch myself every day. And this, you're doing this post-production. This is the first time for a feature film. So right. you're learning as you're doing. Learning right? a lot. I mean, I'm away from home all the time. Um, Did the fact that we, had, we have a lot of equipment for film students here at Chapman University yeah. help in terms of what you're doing? Oh, now? absolutely. I mean, that was the thing that was amazing was that Chapman isn't just giving you the tools to make a movie. They're giving you the tools that you'll be using the rest of your life. So it's been... It's been absolutely invaluable. I mean, same with when we're actually shooting. We're using the same types of equipment. You know, you're not, we're not shooting at Chapman on home video cameras. You're shooting on film cameras. You're shooting on industry quality equipment. And then same with post-production. So I'm familiar with the whole process. I can sit in a room and listen to everyone talk about it and not be a fly on a wall like a dummy. I actually can be engaged in the conversation, actually give input and all those things. It's really, really awesome. Well, Eve, this was fun, wasn't it? This As was two movie great goers, fun. we saw a great flick and met a, <laughs> a, an incredible young filmmaker that we are very proud of Thank here at Chapman University. Much. Brett, we wish you the best of luck. And Thank you. I can't, now you've whetted our appetite. Well, now that we we've go. seen this, which probably we're going to show this episode every Halloween that comes <laughs> up. This is it for sure. Great. Good luck on your feature Thank film, you Huss. We'll be looking for it. Great. Thank Good you guys luck. very much. Thank Thanks for being on our first Chapman Shorts. Yes, it was an honor. And please come back and visit us again. Anytime you like.